Good morning, church. How's everybody doing? Good, sleepy. Hey, raise your, raise your hand if you already went on vacation. Vacation's done. Sad. Raise your hand if you still get to go. Wow, August vacations. That's nice. Hey, if you don't know me, my name is Luke. We are currently in a series called This Verse Changed My Life. Uh, I'm just curious. Raise your hand if something in the Bible has changed your life. Any Bible people out there? Uh, there's nothing like the Bible, right? I mean, this has been the hardest uh, time to prep, trying to pick one verse. Are you serious? Uh, there's so many things in the Bible that have changed my life, that have affected me. Uh, and so what I want to do is I want to take uh, you guys just kind of on a journey through my story a little bit, uh, a little bit of my testimony and how I came to know Christ as my Savior. Uh, and it'll, it'll clue us in on what verse has changed my life. It, it continues to change my life. It's a, a constant going back to it over and over and over again. So if you want, bring up this first picture for me real quick. Uh, this is me. Oh, yeah. Oh, this is me. I'm about, what, 14 years old? No, I'm about three years old there. Uh, I am actually standing on uh, the mantle above the fireplace. Uh, and that is a book. And if you can't see it, the book says, Jesus wants all of me. Uh, and so I was blessed and fortunate enough to be raised uh, in a Christian home. I had two Christian parents. They taught us the Bible at home. We went to church every Sunday. Uh, one of those dads that was like, go to church or die, kind of see, at the, see in the minivan. Uh, and so I was at church every week. I grew up in a gospel teaching, Bible teaching church. But uh, raise your hand. Please don't leave me alone up here. I get nervous. Raise your hand if you uh, were raised in the church and it just didn't take, just didn't take. I don't know why. Uh, I, I thought church was boring. I didn't like it. I, I viewed God as just kind of this guy that was far away from me. It didn't have anything to do with me. I was a pretty good kid. Uh, I, I got okay grades. I, I didn't cuss. I didn't do these bad things. And so the gospel that Jesus came to save sinners just didn't click in my head. I just didn't need it. I felt like it wasn't for me. And so if you found me at the right time through middle school and high school, I would sound a lot like a Christian. I knew Christianese. I knew how to say the things. I knew how to do the things. I knew how to show up at church on time, join a serve team, all those things. But I had no relationship with Jesus. I didn't know him, never met him. So come to this next picture. When I was 16 years old, I went to a Bible study uh, at Dave and Bev Duma's house. Uh, I'm on the far right. Pastor Mike Duma is right below, bottom right. Uh, he was about 20 years old, and he was running a Bible study. And I'd been to Bible study. I don't want to go to Bible study. It's a circle. They play Scrabble. It's weird. I don't like it. I, I know Jesus. I know God. I know that stuff. I'm good. But what I had seen was Jesus changed my brother Kyle's life. And he said, hey, you need to come to this Bible study. And so I went and we circled up. Same old. Everybody's sharing their feelings, you know, prayer requests, unspoken, you know, that stuff. Christian stuff. Oh, my goodness. Till we opened up the Bible. And they read this verse and it says, you can't inherit the kingdom of God unless you're born again. And I'd heard that so many times growing up, but at 16 years old is when that verse just kind of stuck me. Man, I, I haven't been born again. I, I've never had a rebirth. I've never given my life to God. And so that's when I gave my life to Christ. Then I went, I need some hands again. Don't leave me alone. Who started out strong as a Christian and then just fell off? Where did they go? Man, started off good, started off strong. Ever heard the phrase, on fire for God? Man, I was inviting kids from my school to come to this Bible study. I was sharing the gospel uh, of Jesus in the weight room, when, in sports, in the huddle at football, and then I just kind of started to drift away. And by the time I was about 20, 21 years old, I had chalked this up to a phase. Hey, Christianity was just a phase for me. That's not something, you know, it was cool. I, I accepted Christ, whatever. I, I got my heaven ticket. I'm good now. I understand. But that, that was just a phase for me. That's not for me. And so in college, I, I abandoned God. I didn't follow him. I didn't talk to him. I didn't care about what he thought. I didn't care about what his word said. Brings us to this next picture. When I was 21 years old, I went to another Bible study. The circle remains. I mean, there's one constant in life. It's the circle of a Bible study of the local church. So I went to a Bible study in college, and this is when I said, hey, God, I'm following you. I'm an adult now. This isn't a phase. This is my life. I'm following you. I'm abandoning all other things. I'm not doing it my way. I'm doing it your way. And this was a college ministry at uh, the Akron Chapel. I went to Akron University, and 
When I was about 21 years old, that's when I, I put a stake in the ground. I put my foot down and I said, hey, no more back and forth. No more circling, following Jesus a little bit, then not following him, following him, then not following him. I'm done with that. I'm following him for good. And so I constantly look back on my life and I try to examine why were there times in my life where I just didn't care about the gospel? I didn't care about God. I didn't care about his word. Maybe growing up, you know, that, that Christian phase where I just went in church, but it, it didn't take. And then this phase after I got saved, after I accepted Christ, I just walked away from him. Why? Why did I do that? And so this is kind of where I want to jump in, and we're going to get to the verse that changed my life in a minute, but this is my main problem, I would say, if I could uh, uh, self-examine myself. It's having an incorrect view of ourselves causes us to live confused and frustrated lives. And so my question all the time with the, I, I say this in the college ministry a lot, this Christian thing, they think it's funny or cool, whatever, this Christian thing, where, where's my role in it? What am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to relate to God? What, what's my part? What's the view of myself? I, I know I'm a sinner, I, but I know I'm also redeemed. I know I'm imperfect, but I know I'm also hidden in Christ. Like all these verses wrestle around in my head and I, I have a wrong view of myself all the time. And when I have an incorrect view of who I am, it causes me to be really confused and really frustrated, which leads to the actual problem. And the cure is this, that having an incorrect view of God causes us to live confused and frustrated lives. So we're going to get to the verse that changed my life in a second, but this is the problem. This is the problem that I've had, I used to have, I still have a lot of times that I don't view God the way that he really is. My flesh gets in the way, I, I view him as, you know, maybe angry, or we'll get into some of that in a minute, but I just don't know him very well sometimes. In times in my life where I, where I wasn't following him, I just didn't know him that well. I didn't know what his word said about him. I didn't know who he was, how he related to me, what's my part, what's his part, what am I supposed to do, what does he take care of? I just was always jumbling that in my brain. So here's the process. This is what it looks like. Maybe you're dealing with this. Uh, maybe you've dealt with this in the past, but this is what happens. Frustration and confusion lead to doubt, just a, a little bit of doubt. Hey, maybe, maybe the Bible's not as reliable as we thought. Maybe, maybe God's not really what the pastor says he is. Maybe, maybe that was just, you know, just a little bit of doubt. Maybe the Christian on fire thing was cool when I was young, but now that I'm older, I just, you know, I've kind of settled in. Just, just a little bit of doubt. Then doubt leads to drifting. So when that doubt gets in our hearts and in our minds, then, you know, it's just kind of one of these games. Just go to church, you know, every now and then, you know, I'll serve maybe at the one thing. You know, this was me. It was like, ah, I'll go every other week. I play softball sometimes on the weekends. The Bible, I've read it, I'm good. And we just kind of pace our way away from God. And then drifting leads to disappearing. And what I mean by disappearing is that we all know somebody who used to be here. We all know somebody who used to be a follower of Christ. And for me, there was a season of my life where it was my Christian friends, my my, my accountability, my mentors that I'd had, where'd he go? Where'd Luke go? We haven't seen him in a couple years. Doesn't come to church, he doesn't come to Bible study. Drifting leads to disappearing. This process is very common. Uh, maybe you feel in your heart uh, this process has happened to you. Maybe it's currently happening to you, but I wanna go all the way back to the book of Jeremiah uh, to a very interesting, very important uh, process that happens with God and his people. So bring up Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 2. Go and proclaim in the hearing of Jerusalem, thus says the Lord, I remember the devotion of your youth, your love as a bride, how you followed me in the wilderness in a land not sown. God is talking to us, to his people, and he's saying, I remember when you used to follow me. I remember when you used to love me. I remember that. I remember when you used to be on fire for God. I, I remember. And then in verse five, if you wanna skip down to verse five, the Lord says one of the saddest things in all of scripture, sometimes we can read the Bible like robots, like auto-tune. Thus says the Lord, what wrong did your fathers find in me that they went far from me and went after worthlessness and became worthless. So God says, hey, I remember you used to be on fire for me. You used to love me. And then he looks at his people and he says, what did I do? What did I do wrong? 
Was it me? That's what God is saying to his people. Was it me? Did I do something wrong? Maybe you're a parent of a child and your child's not doing the right thing and you, as a parent you go, is, is it my fault? Did I do something wrong? Maybe it's me. That's what God's saying. What, what, what fault did you find in me? What wrong did you find in me? What did I do wrong? And then four verses later, he says the most beautiful thing, Jeremiah 2, verse 9, therefore I still contend with you, declares the Lord. And with your children's children, I will contend. You used to follow me, but now you don't. You used to be on fire for God, but now you're not. And then God says, but I'm still here. I'm still here. I will contend with you. I will contend with your kids. I will contend with their kids. I will be here. So this is the process that I faced over and over and over again in my life. I was on fire for God, drifted. On fire for God, drifted. On fire for God, drifted. And God stands and he says, hey, I'm still here. I'm still here. And so I've constantly asked the question, why does God stay? Why does he stay around for me? Isn't he sick of me? Isn't he annoyed with us? Isn't he tired of this, you know, bargaining, God, I'll stop this if you do this, and I'll, don't, I'll never do this again, I'll do this. Isn't he tired of that? And so that leads us to when I took a job at Maranatha Bible Church, youth pastor. Uh, this is a mission trip we went on. I'm in the far left. Mike's on the far left. He's bald. Don't, that's a story for another time. And I remember I was so hard-pressed with this circle that I was in in life, following God. Good for a season, bad for a season. Good for a season, bad for a season. Just exhausted from it. And I went to this, uh, it was a youth kind of conference. We were leading a youth group there. And uh, we went on uh, to this big church and they had this stage and a guy got up there and he literally just read a verse. He just read it. He didn't preach it. He didn't explain it. He just read a verse before he sang it. I thought I was gonna fall over. I started to cry. I was like, God, I hear you. And this is the verse. This is the verse that changed my life. Galatians 4, verse 7. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. I've over and over again asked God, why are you still around? Why are you still contending with me? Why are you sitting there saying, you've abandoned me, you've disrespected me, you've sinned against me, you've, you've, you've promised that you'd shape up and you haven't yet, and I'm still here. Why? Because you're my son, because you're my child, and I'm your father. Amen. I'm your father. So let's look at the whole passage real quick, and then I just want to share a couple things uh, that I feel like I felt in life about God being my father and then uh, truth from, from God's word. This is the, the passage that this verse is attached to. Um, what I want to do is I want us to look at uh, who we are and who God is, who we are and who God is. And then I want us to look in this passage, what are we supposed to do, right? Because when we get on stage and we preach sermons, we got to apply it and we got to do something. What are we supposed to do? Okay, let's, let's read it. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not God's. But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world whose slaves you want to be once more? How could you turn back? So the remainder of our time, I just want to talk about this idea that God is our Father. And I'm not naive. I know that if any time uh, we bring up the idea of a, of a Father, that it doesn't take long before emotions start welling up inside of us. It is an emotional thing. The relationship between a father and a son or a father and a daughter is a deep, powerful thing. And so what I don't wanna do is I don't want uh, this to turn into a time where we are just thinking of our earthly fathers. Because maybe you've heard uh, pastors will say, hey, you'll view God through the lens of your father. Anyone ever heard that before? I just want to get away from that just for a minute. 
But I know that there's us, uh, there's people in the room, there's those of you in the room where, man, your dad was, he was good. He was on the ball. He did what he was supposed to do. He taught you the Bible, he cared for you, he loved you, but I know that there's those of you in the room that it's not good emotion. It's not, it's not good memories. It doesn't make you feel the way that you're supposed to feel, thinking of your father. Bring up this next picture. This is my dad. Uh, he had four boys. That's crazy. Uh, I'm the cute one. You can figure that out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So this is, this is my dad. And I bring this picture up because our flesh, us as people, when we hear that God's our father, our flesh just jumps to trying to figure it out trying to figure out the relationship we had with our dad. Uh, what did my dad do? What did he not do? What did he do good? What did he do bad? What am I gonna do better? What, 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 you know, we just try to figure it out, our flesh. And so go back to the verse, if you could, uh, Galatians 4. Uh, back one more. <clears throat> one more, sorry. God has sent, right here at the bottom, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. And so if this turns into a time where we talk about God as our dad, God's our heavenly dad. If I try to figure it out on my own, it's not gonna work. But God has sent his spirit into my heart and the spirit in my heart is what cries out, Abba, Father, Dad, my heavenly father. And so what I wanna do, something uh, just a little weird, I wanna pray. I just wanna mid-sermon pray. I wanna ask God, to do what he always does, to clear our minds and so we can get an accurate, good, perfect view of who our heavenly father is. Let's pray real quick. Father, I ask that you would please just help us understand who you are. Understand how perfect you are, how good you are, how much you love us. God, help us in this time. Help us to, to feel that our spirit is crying out to you. Abba, Father, my dad, I need my dad. Help us in this time. Not to cloud our minds with anything earthly, but that we could see what you see eternally. And I ask this in Jesus' perfect name, amen. So what I wanna do is I wanna share uh, three ideas of what I thought of God. Uh, maybe you think this uh, a lot, or maybe you've never thought this before. Um, these are things that I've thought of God in the past. These are things that my flesh constantly wells up to think of God. Uh, and the first one is that God is an angry boss. Uh, that is what my initial response to God is. Uh, growing up in church, I would hear stories about God and the Old Testament and different things, and I'm like, he's mean. He, he's mad. He's always mad. Why is he mad? And so my flesh or what I was thinking was, he's angry at these people. He must be angry at me. And the, the second thing, a boss. Man, I cannot get out of this relationship with God to save my life. I constantly believe that I work for God, that God has employed me and that I need to do well, and so God will affirm me. If I, if I do a good job, then God will like me. If I do a good job, maybe I'll get a promotion. Maybe God will give me more opportunity. He's my boss. So the verse, it says this, this phrase, it says you're no longer a slave, but a son. And so the slave part of it, that's where we think we are. We, we think we work for God. We think that he's an angry boss. He's somebody that just you know, he's mad at us. He's expecting us to do good. He's expecting us to act good and to speak good and constantly in my mind that God's my boss. There's a very famous story in the Bible in Luke 15. It's called the prodigal son. And Jesus is telling a story. He's cluing us in on who God the father is. The story's about the father. And this son, he goes to his dad and he gets his inheritance early and he runs away and he blows it. You guys know the story. He just blows all his money. He, he ruins his, all, his dad's stuff. And the, the, the son comes to his senses. And the first thing that he comes to his senses is, I'll go back to dad's house and I'll ask him for a job. I'll ask him for employment because he's living like a slave. He thinks he's a slave. He thinks God, the father, is an angry boss. I constantly am trying to work for God, do good for God. If he would just see all this stuff I'm doing, if he sees how much I'm working, how much effort I'm putting in, how much I'm reading the Bible, God, God do you see me? Do you see it? Are you gonna give me a promotion? Or are you pleased? Does anyone do that? Man, God just seems like our boss. The second thing that I constantly come back to is that God is distant and quiet. Um, I would say most of us have probably felt this, that God is really tight, with some people, uh, but not with me. 
God is really good at speaking and communicating uh, to, to them, but I, I'm not so sure. And so growing up in church uh, and, you know, even times in college when I was trying to follow the Lord, I would hear people say the phrase like, God told me, or God said, or God laid it on my heart, uh, if you're Baptist, or God, you know, he said this, or he, he wants me to do this. I think my calling in life is this. And I'm like, what's his number? How do you guys know this? How, where are you getting this from? Has anyone ever met just a very confident Christian, just the God said this and I'm doing this? And I'm like, really? Are you sure that's not like maybe your thoughts? Like, have you ever struggled with that? Is that God or is that me? Is that God telling me to do that or is that me? Like, he just seemed distant and quiet. And so I never viewed God as my dad, never viewed him as a heavenly father because a father's supposed to come home after work. Father's supposed to be there. Father's supposed to play, you know, in the yard. And I never felt that with God. Felt like God was distant from me. He was far away. He was, he was quiet. But I knew there was a God. You know, he created the earth. He, he did all these things, but he's not, he's not in Suffield. He's not where I'm, where I'm at. That's what I thought. He's distant and quiet. The last one's this, uh, that God is annoyed at me. This is what I thought. God's just annoyed at me. Kind of touched on this at the beginning, but I would constantly look at the cross and, you know, even a, a Good Friday service, we would talk about Jesus dying for us. He was beat. He was bruised. He was mocked. He was spit on. They put a crown of thorns on his head. They drove stakes through his hands, and they killed him. And I'm like, for me? Are you crazy? You, he did that for me? That's how I, I still feel that. There's no way that he would do that for me. Did he know that we wouldn't really pan out? Did he know that us in the room were, were not that good? Did he know that? Like, I would always go back like, man, maybe he thought this was going to go different. Just annoyed at me. Man, I pray too much. I ask for too many things. I'm constantly praying about myself. I'm, you know, I'm all, that's what I always think. He's just annoyed with me. I remember being in college, just in this circle. Good for a while, bad for a while. Good for a while, bad for a while. And I just remember hitting my knees and being like, God, aren't you sick of me? Aren't you just... Go to somewhere else. Go to somebody else. Like, give up on me. Aren't, aren't you sick of me? Just annoyed with me. No matter what. No matter what. There's nothing that you can do to make God not love you. There's a pastor that gives this uh, analogy. I don't have kids yet, but he talks about uh, he had a baby, right? And you got, you got like a six-month-old baby, and you're just constantly tending to the baby and, 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 you know, changing their diaper and waking up in the middle of the night and trying to feed the baby. And he's like, in reality, from a transactional standpoint, that baby doesn't provide anything for me. Zero. I provide 100% for that baby, and that baby doesn't provide anything for me. And there's nothing I love more than that baby. The, we don't supply anything to God. We don't give him anything. He gives us all things. We, we, we give him back zero, nothing. He doesn't need anything from us. And he loves us more than anything. John 3, 16, everybody knows that verse. For God so loved the world, so loved the world. Doesn't say God loved us. He loves you. You've heard that, God loves you. No, he so loves you. He's in love, so love, no matter what. The world's love's transactional. Even if you feel like you're a really good person, and uh, you, I love unconditionally. That's pretty hard for us. I love my wife unconditionally and my family unconditionally, but I could probably think of a couple things that would make me not love them, right? That's just, we're people. God's like, there's nothing you can do. There's nothing you can do to make me not love you. Uh, I wanna read this verse. Uh, it's a couple verses in Romans. Some of you might know this. I call this a Bible hug. Uh, if you ever need a hug from God, uh, read Romans 8. It's a Bible hug. If you don't like hugs, it's a Bible handshake. <clears throat> so Romans 8, it's not on the board. I just have it here. It says, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. Nothing. Nothing, nothing you've done, nothing you're doing, nothing you will ever do. God loves 
Absolutely no matter what. In John 10, it says this. It says that if you're in the Father, see the phrase, in the Father's hand, God has you in his hand, there's nothing that can snatch you out of his hand. Nothing. Nothing that people can do, nothing that you can do, nothing that someone can do to you, nothing that you can say, nothing, because God has you in his hand. The second thing uh, is this, a father that provides and protects. Our heavenly father is a father that provides and protects. Um, Matthew 6, any anxious people out there? Anxious brothers and sisters? You all cool? All right, no problem. Uh, Matthew 6, man, just the, the, the cornerstone of advice for being anxious. God says, look at the birds, nasty little birds. I'm not a bird guy. Little birds. Look at the birds. I feed them. I give them a house. I give them, you know, place to stay, barns full of grain. I'll take care of the birds. How much more will I take care of my children, my kids? I have chickens uh, I feed them like this. Uh, I don't think I'm going to feed my kid like that. I don't think I'm just going to go, that's what God does to birds. He's like, I'll feed the birds. You think I'm going to take care of you? I will provide and protect you. But here's the problem for us. We think provision and protection is for, you know, little kids. I don't need that. I'm grown. Yeah, God had to help me at the beginning. I was trying to figure out what the Bible said, but I know the Bible now, so I'm good. I, I, don't, I don't need him. In John 21, it says one of the coolest phrases it says this, uh, it's so counterintuitive. It says, Truly, this is Jesus talking. Truly, I say to you, when you were young, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. When you were young, you, you used to do your own thing. When you were young, you used to take care of yourself and do your own thing. It says, but when you are old, now you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you may not want to go. <sighs> to be God's child, we have to, let him provide and protect us. That's hard as adults. We can constantly say, I, I got this. God's my boss. I, I just work for him. I, I don't need help. I'm grown. Why would I need him to take care of me? I, I have a budget. I, I go to work. I don't need him to provide and protect for me. We constantly think that we have it. It's the sin of all people that I got this. The I got this sin. Man, that is me. God, I, I got this. I, I know what your word says. I'll do it, but I got it. Don't worry about me. I, I can take care of myself. In Psalm 23, it says that the Lord is our shepherd, that he, he takes care of us. He guides us. He, he, he's like a father. He takes our hand. He walks with us. This is something cool I, I constantly remind myself. Uh, whenever you accept Jesus as your savior, uh, the Bible would say you're born again, that you're a new creation. You've had a, a new birth. So whenever that happened for you, maybe it hasn't happened yet, maybe it was you know, recently, that's how old you are. So I, I was accepted Jesus as my savior 10 years ago in June, so I'm 10. So I'm figuring out how to ride a bike. You know, I'm figuring out, about to go to middle school, nervous. You know, I'm 10, I'm 10, I'm a 10 year old. To, to God, I, I'm 10, I, I, I can't do much. I mean, $5 is like $500, I'm 10. So that just constantly gives me peace that, man, whatever age you are in the faith, just give yourself some grace. That's how old we are. I need provision and I need protection. Number three, a father that encourages and affirms. Occur, encourages and affirms us. Um, there is nothing sweeter in the world, I think, than the approval of people. Oh, man, I'll do anything to get it. I'll make up a joke just to get a laugh from a stranger. I'll do anything to get approval. I need encouraged. I constantly need affirmed. I need told a good job. I need told a good job from the right people. I need told that, you know, fill in the blank. I love, oh, we love compliments. It's just in our bones. Man, think about your boss at work if they notice you. Think about people in your family if they notice something you did. It is the hardest thing in life to do something and not somebody notice it. Oh, I just want someone to notice it, but not too much because Christians, you know, you gotta do it in secret, so just maybe a little bit, I'll do it over here and then kind of peek over and I'm like, yeah, you know, just for a little bit of encouragement, a little bit of affirmation. We love the approval of people. Man, it's so good. It's, I say it's sweet to the taste. 
It just tastes good when someone notices us and affirms us and encourages us. Uh, I wanna read just a few things from the Bible um, that God says that we are. There's a verse in Galatians 1.10. I always say, this is your tattoo verse. This is your, your uh, sticky note on the, on the driving wheel verse, your mirror verse. This is it. Galatians 1.10 says, am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Because if I'm seeking the approval of man, I can't be a servant of Christ. Am I trying to please people or am I trying to please God? Man, I'm right there with you. But here are some things that God says that we are. This is what God says that we are. God says that we're saved if we believe in him, that we're redeemed, that we're chosen, that he, he chose us, that I'm a child of God. Jesus looks at his followers and he says, you guys are my friends, that we're a friend of God that I'm justified, that I got an F on the test and Jesus got an A and we switched tests. I'm justified, I got an A. I'm united with God, I have access to God now. There used to be a, a fog, a, a smoke that I was on the outside looking in and, and now that I'm in Christ, I'm, there's access to him. I'm bought with a price that Jesus bought us. I'm a member of God's body, the church, Man, so many of us have felt isolated, like I don't have any people, nobody, nobody I don't fit in here. They say the common uh, fear of the next generation is that they don't fit in. I fit in in God's family and his body, the church. God has given me spiritual gifts, not because I earned them, but because when I accepted Christ, he just picked some out and gave them to me, like a good father giving me gifts. I'm a minister of reconciliation, not because I get to teach on a stage, but because I'm in Christ, so now I get to minister to people. I get to pray for people. I get to connect people to God. I get to tell them that they can be reconciled to God. I'm hidden in Christ. So Jesus stands in front of me before God the Father. I'm, I'm behind him, I'm hidden. A Couple more, the Bible says that my sins are covered as far as the east is from the west. And the last one is that I am a citizen in heaven. Man, my name's up there. Sometimes I close my eyes and I see a little, a, a little mailbox that says Luke Kramer. I have a place up there. I'm a citizen of heaven. Jesus said, hey, not, not that the works that you've done, but count it all joy that your name is written in heaven. That's what the Father says about you and I. All those things. Man, if we could just dig into the approval of God, that God approves us, that he encourages us, he affirms us. Last one, number four, a father that enjoys your company. God is a father that enjoys your company. Um, have you ever heard the phrase, I, I love them, but I don't like them? Uh, that's a common phrase. Uh, baloney, can't love someone if you don't like them. I would make the argument that God likes you, that if you're in Christ, that he, he likes me. Man, sometimes that's harder than loving someone is liking someone. Ever said to your spouse, man, I love you, but get away from me. I love you, but I don't like you because liking is difficult. Liking someone is hard. You have to in, embrace all their nonsense, embrace all their mess and their, their, their sin and their struggle. You have to embrace that. And God the Father says, man, I enjoy your company. I like you. I like spending time with you. I like hearing from you. I like talking with you. I like sitting with you. I like when you're alone just with me, not all other people at church or your group, but just you and I. I wanna spend time with you. There's a verse in the, the book of Zephaniah in the Old Testament. Zephaniah 3, it says, the Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He's, he's with us. Our Father is, is near us. And then here's the crazy part. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love and he will exalt over you with loud singing. So when God looks down from heaven and he sees us, bunch of nobodies, really, he doesn't go, oh my gosh, they did that? Oh my goodness, are you kidding me? How many times I gotta tell them? How many times do I have to discipline you? How many times do I have to steer you in the right direction? That's not what God does. It says that God looks down and he sings and he dances and he hums, and he whistles, and he's excited because he likes us, because he loves us. 
a father that enjoys our company, looks down on Luke and he's like, man, <laughs> oh my gosh, oh man, he's just dumb, but I just love him. Like, oh, he's just my kid, my child, just can't get his act together, but I just, there's something about it, I just like him, just enjoys our company. That's God. Man, have you ever believed that actually, that God likes you, that he, he wants to spend time with you, he enjoys your company? Let's wrap up. This is, uh, this is how I want to close. Two things, really. Uh, one is this. There's a, a, a fallacy or uh, I think something that's taught wrong, that uh, it's taught all over the world. It's taught, you know, even by people who are not Christians. It's not just like a, a Christian thing. They'll say, we're all God's children. Man, we're all God's children. He, he'll understand. We're all God's children. He, he loves everybody. He, he's got, he likes everybody. He affirms and encourages everybody. And I don't think that's what the Bible says. I think in John 1 lays it out very clear. If you want to bring up John 1, 12, it says, but to all who did receive him, talking about Jesus, all who did receive Jesus, who believed in Jesus's name, God the Father gave the right to become children of God. There's a becoming of a child of God. There's a, there's a becoming of a child of God. We're not all born God's children. We're born in iniquity and sin is what the Bible would say. And so if you're sitting here and all the things I've said just sounded like, cool. Yeah, he affirms me, he encourages me, he spends time with me, he loves me, whatever, yeah, cool. Have you ever actually had a relationship with your father, with your heavenly father? Have you become a child of God? And the verse is beautiful because it tells us exactly how to become a child of God. Receive Jesus. If you receive Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life, you become a child of God. And then God becomes your dad. Man, that's awesome. I want to end with uh, an illustration. I heard this in college, and I think about this all the time. Uh, this is, I think, an accurate view of who we are and who God is. So there's a little boy, and he wakes up early on uh, a Saturday morning. He's about five years old. And he, he just wants to do something nice for his parents. He doesn't know what. He Maybe get him a gift or something. And then he decides, oh, I'll make him breakfast. They love breakfast in bed. I'll make them pancakes. And so the five-year-old goes into the kitchen and he, he's trying to figure out how to make pancakes. He's seen his, his mom do it a few times. And so he just wants to try to figure it out. So he gets the bowl out of the thing and he gets the sugar and he pours it in and he gets flour and he goes to pour the flour and he just dumps it just all over the floor, the whole bag of flour. So he looks at the flower and he's like, oh my goodness, I'm trying to do something good for my, for my father, for my, for my parents, and now I've made a big mess. So he kind of scoops up some of the flower and he tries to get it into the bowl and you know, he's making a mess. It's all over his arms. It's all over his hands. And, oh my goodness, maybe I should clean this up, but no, I'm really set on making these pancakes. So then he gets in the fridge and he gets some eggs, got, got a few, and he cracks them on the side of the bowl and all the shells just go into the, to the bowl, just messing it up. So there's shells and eggs and sugar and flour all over the floor. Then the dog comes through the kitchen and just plows through and takes a, a footprints of flour all through the floor. And he can hear his parents starting to wake up and he's like, man, I gotta hurry up. So he gets in the kitchen and he just throws some stuff in it, just anything he can find, he stirs it up. And then he realizes he doesn't know how to work the stove. So he gets over to the stove and he's trying to turn it on, but he's too short and he's flicking with the things and he doesn't know and he hears the noise and then he gets a stool and he, he doesn't know how much to even put in there. So he kind of just dumps the bucket or the bowl into the, the pan and it just spills everywhere. Then he slips off the, the stool and he's laying on the ground and the kitchen's just a wreck. And he's about to cry. He, he doesn't know what to do. He's tried to do a good thing for his father and he just messed it up. And should, I, should he clean it up? Should he just admit what he did? What should he do? Should he hide? And then he looks up and he sees his father standing in the doorway. Oh no, man, I'm gonna get scolded. I'm gonna get punished. I'm gonna get disciplined. He's gonna be so mad at me. He's gonna yell at me. And the father walks through the mess, grabs his son, hugs him in his mess and says, I love you, my child. Let's get you cleaned up. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for being our father. God, I know you're an even better father than we could ever understand. Thank you for loving us patiently when we're just back and forth and we constantly change. And God, you remain the same. And your love is unconditional and it's perfect. 
God, I just pray for all of us that we would understand that we are your children and that you're our father. Just the understanding of that relationship, God, please give that to us. God, we love you. We're thankful for you. Pray that you would be pleased with us in this time that we're we're drawing near to you. God, would you draw near to us? God, we are so thankful for your sacrifice of your son on the cross for our forgiveness of our sins. And God, I pray for anyone in the room who has not yet become your child, God, that you would draw them to yourself. God, that you would beckon them home like a good father. And I ask all these things in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Thank you for being with us. We'll see you next week.